on today's show, we're talking about writing intuitively with our friend Becca Syme. So make sure and stay tuned. Hi, and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. I'm Christina Katane, and I write in Christian dystopian fantasy. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Jamie Hirschberger, and I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are so happy that you're here. Thank you for everyone who's tuning in live. We love our chatters. We love our people that listen on podcasts, wherever that might be. We love the people who have joined our newly formed group on Facebook called the Listeners of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. So if you're not on there, come join us. We want to get to know you. We're so creative with names, by the way. Yeah, well. <laughs> no, I we love also, it. It tells you what it is. So We really have to be findable, right? So, mm -hmm. so we start each episode with a little segment we call What's Up? And we go around the table and we each say what's up in our lives. And so today I'm going to start with Jamie. Well, I had a whole nother thing planned for my what's up until you started thanking everybody who listens. Now, I don't know how accurate um, pod charts is because when I went to Apple, uh, no, I went to some other charting um, situation to try to verify the veracity of this, I was uh, given different information. But according to pod charts, I keep getting these emails. And apparently we are charting in both Christianity and religion and spirituality in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now listen, Jennifer. We are an international sensation. Yes, we're big in Africa. <laughs> we do have African listeners. Like we've had people like this to come is in what our I'm chat. Saying. Like, yes, and <laughs> I feel like we should be extra thankful to them because we're actually charting like in yeah. the top 50 if if this information that I got is correct, which again, I tried to go and verify other ways, you know, before I kind of made a claim and then couldn't back it up. But because I want to like acknowledge and show appreciation, um, I, I looked into a little bit because I'm uneducated about that part of the world um, and I'm not afraid to admit that. But there are over 200 languages spoken in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And one of those languages is Swahili. So I thought I would look up a Swahili greeting and share it with you all. So if you were going to say hello in Swahili, you would say Jumbo. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So Jumbo to our friends listening. If if anyone ever over there is, a, I don't know even what time it is there right now, but if it's a time that you could watch us live and tune in, let us know that you're one of the listeners who's helping us chart in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's the only region. And, and you know, I was talking with a friend to try to figure out why this might be. I thought, well, maybe missionaries showed up there who used to listen to us, you know, stateside or something. And um, it's... Uh, I, like, I, I have no idea why or how that would be happening. Yeah. But it's in, always in strange the... for me when I sell books in other parts of the world that, you know, like, yeah, Canada and yeah, Great Britain. But then when you get like a random like Japan or I'll get Italy, like it just still blows my mind. Australia, like people around the world. Like, so, yeah, I have no idea how they're finding us because we're not really we... good about promoting. <laughs> this is why we love our live chat, because uh, the the trusty Becca has reported for us. It is 3.04 p.m. So Jumbo and good afternoon to you if you are listening to us in the DRC. And thanks for being a listener, no matter where you are in this big wide world. That's my what's up. All right. We have lots of chat going on and welcome everybody who's here. Um, but we're not, not going to go through and say hi to everyone right now because we want to get to Becca as fast as possible. But a couple of what's up so far. Alex says, what's up? The school year is over. So like seasonal allergies, I have returned. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Welcome back, Alex. We're glad to have you. This here. is one of those seasonal allergies. I will not be whipping out my flow nays for. Yeah, we're not going to complain <laughs> about you. Uh, Leah says, "What's up? Getting back to the grind and making great progress in my current work in progress. It feels good to be almost done with this book, Beast." I hear that. Piper says, I love that. And seeing where people open my newsletter on the world. Yes, that's mm -hmm. true too. So, all right. Sorry, Tina, what's up with you? Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking this week. Like, Good. I know that's shocking to everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I know I'm noticing some things with my books. So my sales went up about tenfold since I released book two. Mm -hmm. And I've also been seeing people reporting um, wins in like 20 books to 50K and some other groups I'm in. And, uh, you know, like $3,000 a month, $13,000 a month, higher than that. But they are always have a screenshot of their Amazon royalty estimator page. And it'll say all seven books, all 13 books, all mm -hmm. 26 books. And so to me, instead of making me feel, oh, I'll never get there. I realized I have two books. Right. And um, I might only make enough a month to like go to Olive Garden by myself and have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't think it's my covers because when I go look at comp covers in my very small genre, they're all over the place. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason to them, but there are a lot of birds. So I think I'm okay there. And I think I'm okay with my blurb. I think what the issue is, is number one, visibility. And number two, I am in such a tiny niche. Hmm. Piper and I were just talking about this the other day. I literally only have to sell 20 books to hit number one in my category. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough money to even pay for advertising. So it just, it just kind of um, makes it more concrete to me that I really need to expand and go into fantasy with Christian themes rather than Christian fantasy so that I can open my books up to a bigger market mm -hmm. if I want to make a living at this. So I just thought I'd share with you what, all the thoughts that plague me. <laughs> no, I think that's I week. think that's some good things to share too, Tina. I think that that's some good experience, and that um, again, every every year as we look back at our careers and as we develop, we're going to make decisions that we wouldn't have, we weren't informed of before, we weren't ready for. So, yeah, good for you. What's up, What's up with you, Jen? Well, I've got a couple of more in the um, chat. We've got um, Joan says, what's up? I'm not feeling well today, oh. so I didn't go to work. This means, though, that I get to join you ladies live today. So it's all good. <laughs> so she's playing hooky just to be in chat. Yeah, we know, Joan. She's sticking we know. to it. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, you just stick with that story in case anyone's watching this from work. <laughs> Piper says her what's up. Uh, had figured out the ending street sign for my book and i'm charging ahead good wow, for you She's been struggling good. with that yeah um let's see uh, leah wants to tell you that she's noticed a big increase when my series reached three books so and understanding the market is important we can also learn about crossover markets too agree so yeah. my what's up um this week has been a week and i don't really want to go into it um just because i'm just not uh, ready to, to emotionally to go into it. But um, I just wanted to say that because I have been completely MIA from our Facebook group and really from any of my work duties. And I just wanted to like use this opportunity to give a shout out to not only the ladies of this podcast, but our awesome admins are, our, 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 sorry, our awesome uh, moderators over on our Facebook page, Joe and Cindy and Shell and Piper, we just really, uh, uh, Piper is Cindy, sorry. <laughs> we <laughs> really, I I so personally really appreciate you ladies because I kind of fell off the face of the planet this week, but our Facebook page is just rocking. Like they're over there posting and commenting and, and creating conversations and, and adding to people's conversations. And I just really appreciate it. And I, again, if you're not over there, you're missing out. And I want to take this moment of my what's up just to say welcome to our new our new members Yay. welcome to alex roberts welcome mm -hmm. christine josephs um barbara fields mcafee we're glad to have you over there Barb. <laughs> jake doberins from um theophany 
media is over there with us. So hi, Jake. We see you. We hope you join the conversations with us as well. Uh, Catherine Carroll, Teresa Thomas. We miss mm -hmm. you, Teresa, in the chat. Zoe Burton. I don't know if it's Zoe or Zoe. You have to correct me. Uh, Joan, of course, is over there as well. Author Jessica Glidden. Our friend Gigi, that is our big encourager, she's over there as well. Uh, uh, Liz Henderson is over there with us chatting. Kimmy Handy is over there. Our friend Leah is over there as well. Uh, like I said, Shell and Cindy are o and Joe are over there. We just are having so much fun. So if you haven't joined our Facebook group, the link is in the show notes, and you're going to want to come on over there. We have lots of, the, you know, the community that we're doing here and trying to create here. Now it's continued seven days a week over in that Facebook group. So we hope that you all um, um, are going to join us. Barbara says, you pronounce my name correctly. No G. All right. Awesome. Okay. So that's it. Okay. And I just want to mention Rhonda, yes. who is not here with us physically, but is here with us in our hearts. And we love her and we miss her and we're praying for her daily. And we hope that you all are too. Okay, so with that, we are going to transition into the most exciting time today is our topic um, with a special guest, Becca Syme. So I have this uh, introduction that I'm going to read without my bifocals, so <laughs> you'll forgive me if I mess it up. Becca Syme is a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach with a Master's in Transformational Leadership. She's coached more than 5,000 individual authors in the Better Faster Methodology of Success Alignment. She is a US Today, USA Today bestselling author of romance, nonfiction, and mystery, and she lives in the mountains of Montana, where it, where it is always winter and never Christmas. Welcome, <laughs> Becca. That's accurate. <laughs> how are you it's today? It's 50 degrees here today, so that's how I am. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. It'll be fine. It's fine. Is it really 50 degrees there? Oh, yeah. yeah. But it'll get warmer as the day goes by, right? It'll get a little warmer. I mean, I actually, I should be cautious. I don't want to complain about that because I actually really like how cold it is here. Like um, being at a really high elevation and then also being in the arid desert of the Rockies, right? It's always going to be colder here than other places, but I don't like to be hot, which is why I live here. <laughs> what is the sunshine? Do you, do you get a lot of sunshine there? A ton. I mean, okay. we get 312 days. I think we get mm. more sunshine than most of the uh, uh than most of like the midwest and the east coast because we don't have any humidity so we don't have clouds <laughs> jamie's good i know Cold me too Mon and sunny mm, yep. montana you know, like, is sounding delicious right now <laughs> right like, like it'll it'll be um it'll snow sometimes and then literally melt by the afternoon because it gets so sunny in the afternoon so it i love it here it's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I grew up awesome. in Anchorage, Alaska, where the yep. average daily high in the summer is about 65. Right. But we do not get 312 days of sunshine. It looks, it sounds like you have the best of Alaska. Uh -huh. yeah. Jen, All the things I love about it. Do you I think need we a, need a road trip. Yes, a research trip for Jen's Wild West series. We need to go oh, that direction. It was supposed to be set in Texas, but I am still up for <laughs> a road trip and I could my mind could be changed for sure. I love what I love what Shell said. More sunny days in San Diego, but more snow days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. We probably have 300 and 12 snow days as well. <laughs> Lots of people happy that you're here. We are super excited that you're here. So, okay. All right. So let's get into our topic. And the reason we wanted you on is because you wrote this awesome, all of your books are awesome, by the way. I've read them all. Um, but you wrote this awesome book with Susan Bischoff called Dear Writer, Are You Intuitive? And I'm just, I'm just going to give a little review <laughs> just because yeah, I'm go ahead. And, I, and I'm the, you know, I'm in charge. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, this book helped me so much because I realized that the way that I used to write before I learned how to write was to, was to edit and revise as I go. And I was always felt better about my writing back then until I learned how to do it right. And so I went back to doing it the way I always did it. And I'm so happy. My, it's going to take me a little bit longer to write this book. Um, but I think it's not going to take me nine months to edit it. 
yep. like I did. So it's an awesome book. So tell us about the book. Tell us um, why you decided to write it and what, is, what it's about. So one of the most common things we see in coaching, and as I said in the bio at the beginning, right, like I coach a lot. I will coach sometimes eight hours a day and coaching writers is kind of like, I, I'm obsessed with it. And the reason is because most of us think that the way we're doing it is wrong and the way we're doing writing, whatever it is, the way we market, the way we write. And when authors come to us and they're like, oh, I do this and it's so bad that I do this. And I'm like, actually, it's really great that you do that. And it's probably going to be better. Your books are probably going to be better, more successful if you just keep doing that thing, like what Tina mentioned, right? And so as I'm coaching writers, it's like we need guidelines for how to make expectations of ourselves. And so when I think about what are the most common uh, writing coaching questions we get, it's almost always my intuitive desire is to do this, but I've been told I should do this. Mm. And so I'm going to do the thing that doesn't actually align with what I want to do, because it is quote unquote, the thing that we should do. Um, and the reason we specifically wanted to hone in on intuition is um, intuition, by definition, is the I know, but I don't know how I know. I can't explain to you how I know that I need to do this thing or need to not do this thing, but I know it very clearly. Um, and we can't always back it up with data in the moment, but so often it's actually correct in terms of like how we execute successfully. Um, and so I wanted to be able to show writers, especially like intuition is not emotion. Intuition is not fancy. It is a data collection system that happens that very quickly is forgotten or is a subconscious data collection system. So you will be taking information in and making decisions based on that information, but you don't know you did it. So you can't necessarily point to it in the moment. And I felt like authors need to know what that is. They need to understand why that happens so that when they're making intuitive decisions that disagree with something they're supposed to do, they feel more confident talking back to whoever is telling them, don't do that. Awesome. So how do we know that we're intuitive? So usually the, the presence of intuition will have not, it won't be just like one local decision. Like this one time I woke up and was like, I just know I should do this. It will be your whole life. You will have been doing things this way. And it might be, and, and I outline in the, in the book, we talk about different types of intuition. So it isn't just about emotion or people. It can also be about numbers and patterns and it can be about spaces and it can be about spirit, like, like motivation, um, it can be about a ton of different types of things, but you will have that like the ability to look backwards and say, I'm constantly making decisions because I just know something. Mm -hmm. um, and just for Piper's question, are there people who are not intuitive? Yes, there are. Like from our estimation, there's a completely intuitive side and then a completely not intuitive and then the bell curve that most people fit in, like I have some of this, but not all of it. Um, but there absolutely are people who are not intuitive. They're much more concrete, linear. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that intuitive people can't be linear, but the way that non-intuitive brains think is they consciously gather data and information. They consciously go looking for um, why do I do these things and what is the best way to do it? And so, yeah, there definitely are. And, and how we know is by looking backwards at what we've done in our lifetimes and looking at how often I do that. May I ask a question? Um, what if you suspect that you've been squashing your intuition and that you might be a more intuitive person than you realize because um, you've been sort of trained out of trusting that intuition? And how would you regain your intuitive self? So the first thing I would do, and I address this in a little bit in the book, but the first thing I would do is surround yourself with people who are intuitive friendly. 
so that they are not always encouraging you to not listen to that, right? So like if you have that initial instinct, and I would almost do it in the way that we do prayer meditation, right? Where like, I'm going to stop and pause and have that moment of like, let my intuition speak if it's going to speak. Like I want to have a friendly space. And some of that is obviously like who's around us and who's talking, but sometimes it's the talking internally, like the old voices, old memories. Like I think I talked last time I was here about the whole. We're losing her. Mm -hmm. I also like Alex's question of how can you tell if the feelings are intuition or something else? Oh, we got her back. Yeah. We oh, lost you there for there a minute. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened, but yes. Yeah, so uh, the, should I answer Alice's question? Cause I can do that as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, how do you tell if your feelings are intuition? So paranoia and subconscious like fear, right? Like things that are fear will not have the same generative response in terms of if you follow the intuition, it will not be generative or beneficial for you. And so what I always say is paranoia or um, like if I am not doing something only for fear, then if I confront the fear that's underlying that, it will go away. And if I don't, if I confront the fear and it doesn't go away, then it's intuition. But I do think that the, the difference between I just know there should be almost a peacefulness in that moment of like, I, I know, I don't know why I know this, but I know that I need to do this. Like, I, I don't know why I shouldn't be plotting or outlining, but I just know that I shouldn't. Um, and sometimes just to Alex's question, sometimes it does take perspective with someone else. Like if you, if I could sit across from Alex, I could walk through and parse all of that with you and just say, fear, not fear, fear, not fear, right? Because mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would look for in terms of, is it fear, or is it intuition, in terms of it, if it's stopping me from doing something, is the fear will also have a pattern. Like it'll be behind you. There will be teachers, parents, um, leaders, there will be people who are encouraging you to feel fearful about that thing. And that will have a pattern behind you. And so often when we quite like confront the fear or deconstruct the fear, you can feel it when it's just something that you've been told, like it's just a, a pattern, like a thought pattern. Um, but yeah, definitely that there is some overlap. It can take some time to figure out what is, what's, what's there. Becca, oh, I would go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, one more thing. One more thing I forgot to add to the, to this question. Um, after some time, you will be able to illustrate all of the reasons. So like if I give you a week or two weeks to think about it, you will be able to tell me all of the reasons why you needed to make that decision that in the moment you just couldn't access. And then later on, you'll be able to be like, oh, see, this person was shifty. You know, I that person mm -hmm. wanted money. This like you'll be able to figure all that out. So, yeah, great question. So my, my next question is sort of related to that question. Okay. So how do you tell the difference between intuition and, say, um, something that's learned like like if you have ptsd and you're hyper vigilant when it comes to relationships and so then you read people because of that so how do you tell the difference between having intuition about people and something that's learned so it's not there isn't always a difference between them like sometimes intuition is a response to and and i have to be cautious about how i say this because i always refer out to therapists if there's like a, you know, like a disorder of some kind. I'm like, that's not our, our purview. But in terms of can I have a trauma response that is also beneficial? Yes. Like I can have a, um, an ability to watch and read behavior that was created by trauma in my past but which is also producing beneficial responses to me in the future. The key differentiator for me when I'm thinking about, like if I'm coaching somebody and I'm like, do I refer or not, is always, is it healed? 
like is it healed to a point where like the fear is no longer the controlling premise that it's now just this is who i am and i know this is who i am so i i need to question this um there there is a big difference between like is it does it still need therapy or is it a success pattern at this point i have a question that might move us into the second half of our outline so i want to mm -hmm. pose it here um so when you talk about the fear behind the reluctance to trust your intuition, I would imagine that from an author's perspective, that there are a couple of biggies. Because as I'm thinking about this, as you discuss the idea of just doing things internally and you know, not necessarily listening to everybody who has rules for you, what comes to my mind is that people are going to be afraid, I'll never finish this book if I don't follow some rules. Or my book will not sell any copies if I don't follow these rules. And those I would think would be the two big goalposts of fear that would prevent people from embracing the inclination to throw away some advice they're getting. So how do you help people feel reassured that they're not going to realize those two particular fears? So I'm so glad you asked this question because... Um, it illustrates something about the the difference between a concrete thinker and an intuitive thinker, right? Like where if I'm a concrete thinker, I would be very willing to take the step out and prove to myself, right? Like let's prove that I'm going to do this. And a lot of intuitives want to know without proof because that's what we're used to doing is we're used to just knowing answers without the need for proof. So what I would say is, the first thing I would say is trust me, like as someone who's coached thousands of successful writers, when I tell you that there is no predictable success pattern that says that people who edit as they go don't sell books. It just does not exist. There is no predictable success pattern that says people who don't outline don't sell books. It doesn't exist. Like everything that people would say like, oh, but, but, is it possible for me to still be successful? Because all of the success driven people say, you have to do this, I would say that that that's doesn't exist. The second part, though, is what happens if so what we always want to do is to say to ourselves, I can't not take the chance that trusting my intuition will work. So what happens if I don't finish the book, um, it, it's not going to be because you're editing. If you're not finishing the book, it's because there's something wrong with the book or because life is getting in the way or because, and again, this is one of the areas of like, as a success coach, I can tell you people don't not finish books because they edit too much. They don't finish books because the stakes aren't high enough. They don't understand the story in the way they need to to get through the book. The characters aren't fully fleshed out. Um, life gets in the way where they literally are incapable of sitting down to write because life is so crazy. Like all of those things will absolutely keep us from finishing, but just editing itself won't. And if it does, like if that is the case, then that's something that you need support with, right? Like you either need people who can help you to get through those blips because the the great thing about not having skills yet like if i don't have the skill to get through a book i can acquire a skill so that it doesn't take a particular type of person to finish books all it takes is a particular type of skill and so like you can always acquire a skill but yeah that's such a great question because i think we all get paused in the what happens if i'm really not good at this and i would say that's generally not what we see as a reason for why people don't don't finish. We usually see other reasons. Thanks. Good answer. Yeah. Awesome. Piper wants to know, so can intuition can be strengthened like muscles by exercising it more? If so, what does that look like? Yes, it definitely can be, especially, you know, as Jamie had mentioned before, especially if you haven't been trusting it. So like the first thing we would do if we were assessing, like how is your intuition work is we would look for what's blocking the intuition. Like, are there old patterns and old voices that are making you not able to hear it? And if so, can we go after those and start deconstructing them and 
um, talking back to those and releasing those expectations. So that's the first piece. So like if I have, if I'm an intuitive person, but I've always told myself that I will never sell, I will never be any good if I don't do it like James Patterson or like whoever, right? Like if I don't do it this way, I'm never going to sell. And we have to deconstruct all of that structure mm. that is keeping the intuition from working the way that it should work. And sometimes we really have to break some of that down. And what we see happen in writers, let's say you're looking at a 30 year career of a writer. If at the very beginning of their career, they are stifling their intuition, they have to learn the hard way all the time. They have to like go in the direction of outlining and it doesn't work. And not that, not that no intuitive writers outline, but um, I have to go in that direction and it doesn't work and I crash and burn. Then I have to go in a different direction. It doesn't work and I crash and burn. So we almost have this learning curve we have to go through, but learning curves get shortened significantly if you can understand why it's happening and know, is there something I can do to fix that? So if we can deconstruct the voices that are telling us not to trust the intuition, and then additionally be surrounding ourselves with intuitive friendly environments and then encouraging like encouraging the intuition to do the work that it's there to do and again the, there are different types of intuition and not all intuitive writers are pantsers or anything like that right but um but doing the work of the intuitive in terms of what is my particular intuitive gift and how do i trust that more it absolutely will, the more you exercise it will be, and, and exercising it looks like taking the step to trust it. So if I'm going to write an intuitive you know, scene, I take the step and write the scene, and then I don't judge myself for the mistakes because I'm learning how to use that muscle for the first time, and then I just exercise it again. Like I keep doing that work. Okay, so this seems like a really good place to ask you to tell everybody who's listening who just got a taste of this and they're like oh i need coaching oh i need to know more or i need support how they can get those things so we do a lot of either public low cost or free coaching just because like we know writers like again statistically speaking something like 98 percent of writers are not making more than ten thousand dollars a year and so like we want to keep things as low cost as possible. And we also want to offer you the opportunity to do group coaching instead of just individual because that individual has a higher price point. So we do free coaching on our Facebook page, Better Faster Academy, every single month, sometimes more than once a month, but at least once a month. Um, and then we have group coaching on our Patreon, like small group, somewhere between three and eight people with a coach. Um, in that, um, on our Patreon. And then we have individual coaching as well. And you can do individual coaching one time as part of one of our classes, like Write Better Faster, Strengths for Writers, Market Better Faster, stuff like that. Um, or you can do coaching just like one off, um, or you can do coaching every month. So we have a lot of options for how to do it. Um, but we do encourage that if you need the support, to go and find it. It doesn't have to be with us. Like there are lots of writing coaches out there, but we do especially encourage you to look for people who are going to not try to convince you to do it their way. So coaches who coach you to do it their way are going to be hit and miss unless you happen to be wired in a way that responds well to that like program. Um, but yeah, we definitely encourage, uh, we definitely encourage coaching. Yeah. Oh, and thank you, you Leah. You also um, do coaching for people who aren't writers because I bought mm -hmm. my daughter a coaching hour with you for her birthday and yeah. you helped her so much. She was in a job that was highly stressful. She had been trying to get pregnant for years. She left that job in December and got pregnant in February and now she's five months wow. pregnant. They, they left the whole city where they were and this everything's going really great for them. And I, I really believe it was the coaching that helped her get over the the hill of the decision that she needed to make to change things. So it's, I've done the group coaching. I've done the, in the classes. Everything is wonderful. And I highly, highly recommend it all. 
The Piper <laughs> says they're going to name their baby Becca. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a boy or a girl, it's Becca. Boy or girl, it's Becca. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> if it's a girl, they're going to name it Eliana because she found out that that name means God has heard me. Oh, I love that. I so, love you're, that. Um, already helping people today. Alex Roberts said the idea that she's not doing something wrong, that she just needs support really hits hard for her. So oh, yeah, me hard too. Mm -hmm. like great. Right yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah says that yeah. the coaching uh, Becca gives totally has changed her life. And uh, yeah. And then Alex says, congrats on the grandbaby Bambina. Yeah. Oh, thanks. If it's yeah. a girl, I think yeah, it can't be my yeah, favorite so granddaughter anymore. Uh Oh, go ahead. Right. <laughs> Well, I'm so, I'm so glad that Alex said that about the idea of support, because I think so many of us. Uh, so here's a phrase that if you haven't heard it before, hopefully it will explain itself. The productivity industrial complex mm -hmm. that exists specifically in this country is primarily run by people who are wired in one way like one specific way. Mm. And a lot of the advice that we get from productivity bros is basically <laughs> like one, one very specific direction of productivity. And it often does not work for people. And then they question themselves about whether they should be or not. And what we do, because we are, our assumption, when you come into coaching, it's why we do your strength, is that you are correct about what you say about yourself. So if I assume that when you come to talk to me and you say, um, I want to write to edit as I go, and we look at like, let's say your strengths and we see, oh yeah, that trends, that editing as you go trends with certain strengths that you have and the way that your brain is wired. I'm like, okay, great. Let's work with that then. Like, let's assume that you're right about your schedule, about what you're capable of doing and not capable of doing. And I don't mean like, you're right in terms of all the bad things you think about yourself, but more like if you try something and it doesn't work, then we're going to not keep forcing you to do that thing because it clearly isn't working. So we're going to try something else. And what we see is true. So if you think about, again, productivity industrial complex is one this way, right? There might be a thousand ways that people could potentially be productive. And on the spectrum of all of those ways, you might need external support in order to get those things done. And it's not because you don't want it bad enough. It's not because you're lazy or stupid. It literally is because the way you're wired is making you respond to other things in your environment in a way that we need to increase external support so that we can help you get done what you need to get done. So if that wiring is your wiring, and all we need to do is just increase the support that you have, and then you can get the stuff done that you want to do, then why would we not do that for you? Like, why would we keep banging our head against the wall trying to get you to follow the productivity bro advice, which I will not start a rant about that, but I have <laughs> one. <laughs> um, but there's just a thousand ways to be successful and not one. Which is why we always question the premise. Yes. Oh my God. And I think a great way to wrap up our segment is that Leah says for the first time, she believes in herself and her strengths. She needed to know that she is unique and smart. She learned yes. that through coaching group and public sessions, they're brilliant. So yeah, appreciate. I appreciate you very much, Becca. We all do. Jennifer, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Aww. Okay. No, <laughs> no, yeah. but, but yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you when you said that the way that you're wired and how you react with other people like just my my life is in a a tailspin right now and it's like um so much of my support system has either passed or is in a nursing home right now uh in the past few years everything is just kind of and now um I'm the support system for everybody and um and I, I don't bemoan that because God has wired me to be that and has given me that gift to be able to help my dad with, in the ways that he needs help to be there for my mom when I can, but I can't, like, I can't fix everything. And, and then like this week, this is what I didn't share in my WhatsApp that I said I wasn't going to, but like, <laughs> uh, it was a rough week with my mom. It was really bad. And I didn't even come in my office one time except for our meeting to, to plan this, to plan this show. And, um, 
Yeah. So I, I, I feel the support thing. I feel yeah. everything you're saying. I'm just, and it's good that you didn't like, so let's just be honest. Like it's good that you didn't come in your office even one time. Mm-hmm. That's not a failing of yours. It's not a bad thing. It's literally a, a positive and, and beneficial success pattern. It does mean that for certain times when I'm going to be responsive to those needs of other people, that I won't be able to just disconnect that and not care and put it aside and just work. But that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean you don't want to be a writer. It doesn't mean you're not professional. It doesn't mean you don't care. It literally just means that other priorities were more important at the time as they should have been. And when those priorities are safer and more supported, then you'll come back. And I feel like when we don't address that, like when we don't address the fact that not everybody just excels at compartmentalizing and cutting people off and not caring, like we somehow make people feel bad for that. And I really am trying not to swear right now, because it (laughs) makes me so angry when we do that. Because it it doesn't mean that you can't be successful still. It doesn't mean that you're not so professional or committed. It literally just means that you need either additional support or you need to pause and then and then come back, right? Yeah. So for me, it's more the struggle is like, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, the choices I'm making. I know I'm making the right choices, but then there's yep. still that thing in me. Like there's no, so it's got to be some sort of either false intuition. Like it's me either. Or like strength. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That is making me feel like I'm never going to get this next book out or like that I'm I'm not doing enough because like some days there are some days I could be down here working, but I just have to do I just have to sit some like I find myself like just sitting more than I ever did before. And so then I, now, then I carry around that weight of guilt about my, like I'm not doing enough. Like that's my thing. That's, I feel like I'm never doing enough. So let me say one quick thing about this. And then I promise I'll let you guys move on. Um, (laughs) There's a difference between free time and usable time. So there's a huge difference between those two things. I may have a ton of free time and I may actually have nothing scheduled or planned on the schedule, but do I actually have the energy pennies that it's going to take to get that thing executed? I do not. So it is not usable time. So the key difference is like guilt is a productive emotion. So when I feel guilty, I want that guilt to produce work if it can, but I want to not feel guilty when there isn't a reasonable expectation that I could actually do that. So if I'm looking at the time I have available and if I look at the time I have available and it's free time, but it's not usable time, then I want to just talk back to that internal voice and say, it's okay. I get it. We, we want to be super productive. We want to get things done. As soon as we have usable time again, it will get done. It will get done. There is no such thing as forever, right? Like it, it will get done. Thanks, Becca. It's always yeah. a therapy session when you come. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Which that's why I come because we need this kind of thing. Like I was telling somebody the other day, I, I, I don't do this job. Like on the Enneagram, I'm a two. I'm not like a seven or a three or an eight, right? I'm a two. So my goal is to be helpful to writers because in I'm a writer and when we're not okay in the industry, I'm not okay. So like if all the writers aren't okay in their selves, I'm also not okay. So like I, I want us to have these conversations and like, it would have been more comfortable to just like, not ask you how you were because (laughs) it would get emotional. Right. But then you're not okay. So like, I'm always going to say it's always worth sitting in that moment, having the break and like letting that, that false belief that we have get exposed and then, you know, like from a theological perspective, speaking the truth into that moment and saying, mm-hmm. but is it usable time? Like, is it usable time? Because if it was usable time and it, and you were not acting, it would feel good to use that time. But Ugh. when it's not usable time, 
and you can't take action, it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel good to use that time. So like speaking the truth is just, it's important. What a revelation. So I'm happy to do it. Yeah, yeah. What, what you just said, like, if it's usable, if it's free time, and it's usable, it'll feel good to work. You that's yep. so true. Like, yep. that is yep. so true yep. about yep. me. Yep. Yep. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I really want to hug you. I know. I'm, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like ready to hit the button. I've already gone over to your website. So I can like, like, I need some coaching. I know I need coaching. I know. And it, like, that would be like, time that I would be able to like, I'd force myself to set aside, right? Because I have to schedule, but like, it would be good for me because I, yeah. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Becca. And, well, I, and I know that Piper and Leah and I have done the classes and the coaching and it mm -hmm. changed everything for me. Leah said it changed everything for her. I, it is life changing. It is career changing. If you need the, the support and the coaching and the help. So you're going to come back again, right, Becca? You're our of favorite course. guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we right, can't guys. wait for to have you over again. Over for coffee another morning. <laughs> I know, yeah. right? I have my coffee. Yeah, me too. <laughs> in my, believe it, in my, I can't even cup today. <laughs> it's like, perfect. That's great. Okay, any last words before you go, Becca? Oh, I think she's Either frozen. I'm really funny oh, she's or she's gone. Froze. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> What a, take a screenshot of that, Jen. For, you, know, <laughs> you were oh, you froze for a second, Becca. Back like this, like I like you were still laughing, like I was the funniest person ever. So I really appreciated that. Yeah. I'll like freeze in that position for right. all time, Frank. I'll just do a screenshot and leave it as my background on my so that I can see how funny I am all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you have you. any last words for us, Becca, before we have to move on? Yes, this is something I, I always want to say to every group of writers ever. I mean, intuition, yes, I'm here to talk about intuition, but this is also part of the differentiating between intuition and not intuition. Imposters don't get imposter syndrome. So if you feel like an imposter, that is the best ever reason to believe that you are not one and to take mm -hmm. the action and to step forward and do the thing. Because if you believe that you are not qualified or you know that you have flaws or you know that you have faults, that is evidence that you care enough to do a good job. And by nature, that means that you're more capable and qualified than than you could ever believe. So imposters don't get imposter syndrome. We have t-shirts, we have stickers, Remind, put that somewhere, write it on a pad, remind yourself of that. Because when we compare ourselves and we find ourselves lacking, our first, our first instinct is to judge ourselves and assume that we don't belong here. And I just want us to remember imposters don't get imposter syndrome. And that's my final, my final word for the day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Becca, for coming. Yeah, yeah thank you for having me. We will have you again. Yeah. I'm we'll reach back. out. Awesome. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Okay. So now it's time to tradi tradition. Yeah, it's time <laughs> it's to time tradition. To, tradition. <laughs> to the feeding of the backs. And so the feeding of the backs is where we have had a writing sprint for 15 minutes right before the podcast. And we have had a prompt to write to. No time to plan, no time to edit, no time to revise, unless you edit and revise as you write. And, um, <laughs> and now we're going to read them to you. So, Jen, you want to tell us what the prompt was and tell us what you wrote? I would love to. Um, I got to pull it up here. I was, I was saying goodbye in our chat to, <laughs> to Becca. Sorry. I, I don't know why I didn't. I should have assumed that I was going first. <laughs> I was always, I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't no, know. No, no. I would, no, I'm here. I would have picked Jamie, but nobody no. wants to follow Jamie. No, no. So. Right. I want to go first. Please let me go first. I don't want to follow Jamie. <laughs> oh no. Who are you? So at, when I finished oh. today's podcast or finished today's sprint, I was like, well, those are words. So if you know what that means, that means like, I'm not that impressed with what I did. So, but today, first Friday of the month, so it's five words, and our five words were spite, lay, decrease, care, and conglomerate. And I got two words. <laughs> <laughs> One of them I used twice, I think, but anyways. Um, so back in our Widows of the West world, and here we go. <clears throat> Cade sat back in the saddle and watched as Colleen struggled to cinch the rope around the stuck calf. 
Although the little thing had got itself stuck in the muck up to its underbelly, it wasn't so stuck that it had given up its fight, and fight it did. The harder Colleen struggled to get the rope around the calf's shoulders, the harder the stubborn, ca- stubborn cow fought to get away from her. But in its stubbornness, the calf was only inching itself further into the muddy hole. You gonna just sit there and watch? Cade turned and found Chappy approaching slowly on his old bay. Cade shrugged. She said she could do it without any help, just respecting her wishes. <laughs> Cappy gave him a look that said he knew Cade's actions, or lack of actions, was more for spite than for respect of personal space. Never thought of you as the type of man to sit back and watch a woman in distress. She's not in distress yet. I won't let her go get too far in. <clears throat> but despite his assurance, Cappy's words pierced something inside Cade's gut. He shouldn't be enjoying the scene that lay before him as much as he was. No matter how ornery the woman could be, she was still a woman and Cade was no jerk, for a better word. <laughs> he released a heavy sigh and dismounted his horse. But before both his boots hit dirt, Colleen let out a loud grunt and within seconds the calf was free of the mud and was running back toward the rest of the herd. With another grunt, three, two, one. Oh, no, that's all. Okay, that's not positive, but it is. <laughs> I, I love this. Really? It was just, I, I just felt like it was just words, but. I love that she got the cat. Like he was going to like come in like a knight in shining armor with his spurs on his cowboy boots and his taps. And she got the cap out herself. I just love that. Thanks. Yeah, I I don't know why you wouldn't like this. First of all, to bring Cappy back, like I like that he is kind of uh, I don't know if you would call him a foil or whatever he is to Cade's, you know. But it's it's it hints that they've got a relationship from way back, mm-hmm. right? And it tells us a lot about how these two characters know each other in just those few words. It was very well done. Mm-hmm. I was trying, as I'm writing, I, I knew kind of where I was heading, but I wasn't sure if she was going to get the calf out or he was going to get <laughs> out and try. They both were just going to get like completely muddy, but like 15 minutes. And I stopped a bit. Um, well, I don't remember what I stopped for, like trying to figure, I rewrote something, which I know we're not supposed to do, but whatever. Um, and so the 50 the timer was running out really fast. So I'm, but I do like the idea of him sitting there watching her struggle and I want to like really marinate there a lot longer about like how dirty she's getting, how frustrated. And then, yeah, so I do like this scene. I'm probably going to use it, but it needs a lot of work before it can go in the book. So. It's unanimous in the chat that getting her getting the calf out is a very popular decision. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Piper says, I love how he got called out on being a jerk. And yeah, she really was able to do it alone. Yeah, I love that mm-hmm. too. But thank you. Awesome. Uh, nice peek into Cade's mind. And yes, I love that she got the calf out herself. Yeah. And um, so Leah mentioned earlier in the chat that she was a puzzle writer where she writes all over the place. And like, I pref- would prefer not to be honestly, I like to outline, but like, because of the way we have the podcast and we have the sprint and I'm trying to stay in that world, wherever the words lead me, I kind of go all over the place. So we'll see how this book comes together. I'm not really sure how much is going to get used and how much isn't. So I can't wait. Yeah, and you also have Alex saying that was awesome. She also loved that she got it out herself and she enjoyed Cade just laughing in the background for the first part. I think it's okay, right? Like, I would you kind of worry, are my readers going to hate this guy if he does this? But yeah, like, it's kind of fun too to watch this guy, like, just laugh at this woman who's like, you know, I can do that yeah. all my own self. I think she's without, been mean to him. <laughs> I think without his self realization and that prick oh, yeah. of conscience that he was being a jerk. Maybe they would hate him, but I kind of, they sorry. saw that arc yeah. of, oh yeah, I'm, a, I'm being a jerk. I know it sprinted that way, but I kind of wanted him to be like, well, I guess I, I, I didn't want that, the conscience. Yeah. I kind of want to be like, well, I guess I should go up there. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Cappy's watching now. That's kind of what I wanted. So we'll yeah. see what happens at the end. So mm-hmm. uh, what I actually do with this scene. So. Yeah, because she's been really nasty. So no one could blame him on the other hand. Do you know what I mean? Right. I need to make him a little nastier too. Like yeah. I need to, he, he's, he can't be like this really great guy. Like he needs to mm-hmm. like, you know. Be real. Yeah. Because trust me, in the <laughs> real world, when you're nasty to a man, they, they like to give as good as they get sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, not to give away too much of the plot, but like he, he's supposed to want her land. So like, mm-hmm. we're going to see how this turns out. So. Hmm. All right. 
I guess what about you, Bambi? All right, I want to read you. We're going to well, make Jamie go last, right? Well, <laughs> and it's not great today, guys. Seriously. Yeah, but, well, your yeah. gray is better than mine. So my bad. So, um, I used one word, but I used it in multiple ways. Oh. <laughs> so I hope that counts. It was conglomerate, wasn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I knew when I saw that word, I'm like, I'm not using that. <laughs> I knew I wasn't. <laughs> okay. Right. And and this this scene and I guess this might be cheating because this scene is the one that was bumping around in my head all night and I couldn't write anything else but it like my brain just wouldn't let me so horror filled Petra's heart as the ship as the ship my husband works for shipped that was a <laughs> Freudian slipped um, horror filled Petra's heart as the ship moved between Hitchinbrook and Montague Islands into the Prince William Sound. The boreal forest that had covered them just hours before lay flat, their roots reaching into the air as if crying out for mercy. An eerie silence fell over the men who stood along the railing as they passed through the mountains lining either side of the Valdez arm into the bay. It was as if they had been sliced with a knife, their insides laid bare, piles of earth and trees lying in heaps along the shore. Petra gripped the rails in an effort to keep them from shaking his hands. I forgot to say that. It was when they entered the bay and caught sight of Valdez that the weeping began. Strong men, able to survive in the wilderness. Some of them have fought off bears and won. Some who had lived rugged their entire existence, on their knees as they saw what had become of Valdez. It lay in a heap, like a child's block city knocked down in a tantrum. The terminal on the south shore had fared a bit better, the docks and lower buildings were all washed away, but the white domed tank farms still stood on the hill like sentinels. Sentinels, Though some of them had black crude spraying from their seams, running down their sides and creating a black river flowing toward the shoreline below. Men began to run for the lifeboats, pulling them from their bags and descending over the side of the ship. Through the fog of all that had happened, a single thought pierced through. This was his chance. Petra quickly made his way to one of the ladders on the side of the ship facing Valdez. Several men were descending with a lifeboat. Terminal or Valdez, Petra called. Valdez, one man answered. You coming? Yeah, Peter replied, making his way down the ladder after them. They took turn pa turns paddling for what seemed like hours. The Valdez harbor, once full of multiple docks moored with boats of every shape and size, was a wreck of debris. They made their way east of it found a clear spot to land and scrambled out of the raft. Most of the men headed for the heap that used to be the city, but Petra was heading for the highway that led to the north that lay to the northeast, which led through the mountains to freedom. Three, mm. two, one. Wow. It's interesting because his heart isn't there and yet he's observing the people whose heart was there. And it's like an interesting perspective to be a dissociated um, bystander of these other people's grief. It's very well captured. Thank you. I like how you talked about the city, about the destruction and like, it was very emotional and like also very, like you made it like alive, like, you know, calling like parts of it sentinels and like you it was very, a very good description and made it feel like very like real and not just like there was a building over here and a building over there. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. it was very, very well done. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, yeah, do you know how many words that was? No, I have no idea. And, and I'm not sure how to check on my tablet. <laughs> I'm gotcha. used to it. I also love, too, that, like, the way you ended that, and I know it was a sprint, so you just got to end wherever, but um, I can't, if this were a chapter, I'd be turning the page, because, like, okay, now he's by himself, and he's going up this highway, like, what's going to happen next? Like, it was good. I loved it. Thanks, guys. Um, Piper says, your description of the destruction is so evocative. Uh, Leah says, the roots, wow, the destruction is felt. Mm -hmm. Piper says, the toppled children's block towers. Yeah. And then Alex falls right on the heels. Yes, I love your phrasing. The trees crying for mercy and the city being like blocks knocked over and a child's tantrum are the favorites. Mm -hmm. And Barbara says, vivid. Yeah, Thanks, agree. guys. Okay, Jamie. All it right. It's your turn. <clears throat> Here we go. In the great conglomerate that was Omega Corps, Betsy was a nobody. She knew it, but she also knew she had the power to destroy the company in her delicate hands, which now caressed a warm cup of tea in an effort to stave off the chill of the overactive air conditioning, 
which huffed down upon her desk, ruffling her papers and threatening to scatter them throughout the cubicled space, which she really didn't mind, as it gave her a reason to indulge in adding huge pieces of geo to her collection and to prominently display them upon her otherwise barren desk. No pictures of family here, no whimsical desk calendar, not even a simple wooden bar with a gold plate attached displaying her name and the fact that she'd been employee of the month back in 08. Not for Betsy. Betsy had given up on humor in her teens and on humor human attachment decades before winning employee of the month, and the wooden stick she'd been granted upon the occasion had proved to be just the right size for securing a vulnerable bedroom window in her rental. She frowned. Rent was due. She breathed in deeply of her imported tea and wondered if she'd ever become more disciplined with money. Of course, there would be no need to become more disciplined should she only become a wealthy person. And wasn't it power that brought wealth, the kind of power she had only just realized she held? Could that ability to bring down a megacorp not be of some financial advantage to her? The whistle of the air conditioner ended with a click signaling the end of the cooling cycle, and Betsy's train of thought seemed to snap off with equal suddenness. She placed the mug of tea onto the warmer she'd purchased for it, her fifth since discovering such things existed, and the only one which seemed capable of doing the job properly, placed both hands flat on the cool surface of her desk and breathed deeply. She closed her eyes. For a moment, her mind was as still as the air around her and the sounds of chatter from a few cubicles over on her right and the sound of rapid typing from those on her left were the only stimuli she noticed. Then she became aware of her own smell, the onion from the tuna sandwich she'd had at lunch hot in her mouth, the unwashed sweater she wore sending up wafts of body odor only partially masked by sure and dry. Then Charlie Parson's horse-like guffaw and heavy steps started making their way to her cubicle, and her eyes flicked open. She glanced at her hands only long enough to have a fleeting thought. Now that I have this power, how shall I wield it? Before Charlie was there, Mr. Parsons, to her of course, but could she not use what she knew, what she could do or not do as she saw fit, to end the ridiculous corporate formality which had stood between them for so long? How's it going for you today, Miss Sharma? Charlie's chiclet perfect teeth practically glowed from the crack in his tanned face, and his baby blue eyes crinkled at the edges, as though he were truly perfectly happy to see her. Time's up. Wow. Okay, first of all, this cannot be a complete story. Like, there needs to be <laughs> so much more coming from this. Um, I'm scared for this person. I'm scared that she's going to get caught up in something bigger than her. Like, just trying to get money. Like, extortion. And, like, oh, my gosh, Jamie. So much in just, like, 15 minutes. Like, I love this character. Your description. Maybe if you go back and watch this, I actually, like, cringed when you, like, talked about, like, when you're describing her and I'm just like, Oh, this poor girl, like go take a shower. Like so much. Like I could just go on and on and on. So good. Like you are so great at details. I love it. Thanks. I appreciate that. I love Friday. <laughs> well, I mean, there's just so much to unpack there. And mm -hmm. I wish I had the words in front of me so I could go back through and like, know. point out like just the way that you use language and Oh my gosh. Right. <laughs> that's all i have oh my gosh piper says "Ooh, i've been at the mercy of that overactive kind of air conditioner burp me too like that was yes. again she, you create like who would ever think to write about that but when you wrote about that i was instantly there like boom yeah barbara says one i am impressed you use conglomerate betsy <laughs> is every big company's nightmare no more Mm -hmm. Piper says, ooh, the intrigue. Also, chiclet perfect teeth in uh in the crack of his tan uh, face. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Uh okay, this is so compelling. Wow. I must know more. The sinky sweater. What does she know? What can she do? I need to know. Yes, agreed. Joan says, Jamie, you're so good at pulling us into what makes a character unique. And I just wanted you to keep I just wanted to you to keep reading. Yes, sorry. Loving the way you describe Charlie. Thanks. Shell says, so much story in all little details. Great setting and character work. Agreed. So Thanks. well done. I just have to say, too, that my husband is, he likes to watch reruns from the 80s, and he likes to binge watch, like, entire uh, seasons of these shows and he's been watching the A-Team lately and so <laughs> when you describe Charlie, I immediately saw Face. From the oh, yeah. 
I loved the A team when I was a kid. I loved that show. It was so cheesy. I never realized how cheesy it was till you watch it when you're like 53. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like 12. So it was great at 12. But yeah. Yeah. Alex says, amazing. I love the feeling of watching a train wreck that I get from this. Yes. I know she's going to make a terrible mistake with blackmail or something. That's exactly how I was feeling too. Yeah. But I can't look away. Yes. A hundred percent. Alex just like summed up exactly what I was feeling emotionally throughout this whole thing. Yes. Yeah, I can agree. For the hammer to drop. And, I appreciate that. And Barbara wants you to try noir, Jamie. You've written oh. mystery before and you've written noir, haven't you? Well, my um, Frank Fargo, he yes. is a big fan of noir and he lives his life as though he is a detective from that genre. But it is more of a lighthearted escapade type situation. And it's um, good, though. Well, I don't I don't it needs it needs adding like everything else in my to do pile. But that is for another time. Yeah. <laughs> awesome yes appreciate so, that everybody so much as we love the feeding of the backs we need to move on we're a little over today um and so we need to talk about our what's next so let's start with you jamie um my what's next is figuring out why my writing shorts.net security certificate has not manifested to make it safe for people to go there but it's interesting because it just basically is on hold, just like my kind of writing journey seems to be. So right now, uh, these Fridays are really all that I have that is creative and writing related. And is and uh, the Facebook group has really been great as far as keeping me plugged in to this part of myself. So I really appreciate everybody who's been over there to be a part of it and our awesome mods because. Uh, that is somewhere I can go and think about writing stuff and not be thinking about all of these other things that are crowding out the writing right now. So I appreciate all of you. Awesome. What about you, Tina? What's up with you? Or well, what's next for you? My what's next has no, absolutely nothing to do with writing. <laughs> uh, I just have to say that I know everybody's in the United States anyway is looking forward to the celebration of the day we threw off the shackles of England. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Maria. <laughs> I just, I just, just looking for a way to say those words. Yeah. Um, but the day, the day that I'm looking forward to is the sixth. Mm. because my little girl goes for her ultrasound, you know, the 3D one mm -hmm. where they can see everything. And we're going to know, hopefully, if they if the little one will quit doing somersaults for two seconds. Mm -hmm. We'll hopefully know if it's a boy or a girl. So boy, exciting. this is going by so fast for me because I'm not enduring it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And she's... She's just so cute with her belly and she's just always like rubbing it. It's just like, I'm just so happy for her. That's exciting. It's terrific. That's it. What's what next about, for you, Jen? Do we have anything in the chat, Jen, before we go on to you? Um, we do. Do we have time or should we just have everyone head over to the Facebook group? Yeah. What is, why don't we have everyone head over to the Facebook group and Jen will give us her what's next and then we'll call it a day. So after talking with Becca, my what's next is pretty much I'm just going to uh, just be, do what I got to do. I'm going to um, keep my children alive. I'm um, going to keep Susan alive. <laughs> um, and I'm going to, I've already downloaded her book. I'm going to read that, the intuitive, uh, dear writer, are you intuitive? I'm going to read that week and I'm signing up for coaching because I really feel like I, I, after having her on the show, I've thought about it, but I know that like, I need someone to, to help me figure out how I work and what's going on with me. So that like, yes. So that's, it's that's me. It. That's all, that's all I'm it's doing this week is yeah. keeping my kids alive and reading, a, reading her book. And if, and if I feel like working and it feels right, then I'm going to get some work done. But other than that, I'm just going to keep my head above water. So great plan. Thank great you. Plan. <laughs> okay. And next week we're going back to the topic of writing groups and we are going to talk about um, giving critique, how to give critique. So you won't want to miss that. Um, so for today, that concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Until next week, may your pen be prolific, may your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye, Bye everyone. Now. Bye.